Welcome everyone to the last meeting of Materia in the winter quarter of 2021. I am Hector Hoyos, one of the co-chairs of Materia, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all today. Let me start with a quote. Through the stark trees we saw it, the immense toxic cloud lighted now by 18 choppers, immense almost beyond comprehension, beyond legend and rumor, a roiling, bloated, slog-shaped mass. It seemed to be generating its own inner storms. There were cracklings and sputterings, flashes of light, long looping streaks of chemical flame. The car horns blared and moaned. The helicopters throbbed like giant appliances. We sat in the car in the snowy woods saying nothing. The great cloud beyond its turbulent core was silver-tipped in the spotlights. Some might recognize uh, this passage from the novel White Noise by Don DeLillo. The title of the event that congregates us today is Uncontained Toxicity. And DeLillo's novel is one of several uh, cultural forms to try and tackle something like what is um, happening here and what is going on now in the world under uh, the coronavirus. Materia, um, as an anthropocentric research group, um, has been thinking about non-human agencies since 2014, I want to say. I forget exactly when we began, six years ago already. Um, and um, it just so happens that now the entire world is trying to grapple with uh, non-human agency. And I think that now is not the time to retrench in the human. Um, as much as I miss sustained, complex human interaction, I'm also cognizant that such interaction was already codified in academia and is further codified, actually literally codified, through uh, platforms such as the one we're using now, uh, a piece of software known in the early 2020s as Zoom that will soon fade into oblivion as software does. It is no time to retrench to the human, but it is time to think about the relationship of new materialist thinking to humanism. Is it supplementary? Is it complementary? Is it part of a mutual redefinition uh, in ways like a parasit parasite redefines its host? Um, there's much that we're looking forward to learn from our speakers today. Um, we have uh, read in preparation for our gathering uh, a piece by Gisela Jefes called Toxic Nature in Contemporary Argentine Narratives. Uh, it, of course, converses with the Lilo and brings about a really fascinating reading of uh, a corpus of recent Argentine fiction. Um, we read from Ant Niebisch, Feedback, Media Parasites, and the Circuits of Communication. And I think that this parasitical structure in media studies that uh, Nivish talk, uh, talks about has inspired my introductory remarks. <laughs> now, I won't be making introductions. I just wanted to welcome everyone and I'll pass it on to uh, Jimena Diseño and Lea Pao. All right. Well, I'm also very happy to be here. I'm Jimena Diseño, co-coordinator of Materia. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Gisela Jefes. She is an associate professor of Latin American literature at Rice University, where she also teaches creative writing in Spanish. She has published the monograph Las Ciudades Imaginarias en la Literatura Latinoamericana in 2008 and Políticas de la Destrucción, Poéticas de la Preservación, Apuntes para una Lectura Ecocrítica del Medio Ambiente en América Latina from 2013. She has also co-edited the fabulous um, <clears throat> reader, the Latin American eco-cultural reader with uh, Professor Jennifer French. And I was just telling Gisela that I had seen her at the launch of the, of the book and now I have the book in my hand. So this is a way to say like, we are connected in material ways despite the digital. <clears throat> also um, Gisela, has, um, with Professor Carlin Fornov, prepared an edited volume, Pushing Past the Human in Latin American Cinema. 
So this is all to say that um, she is one of the very important voices in um, eco-criticism in Latin America, in Spanish and beyond. So we are very happy to have her today. Um, as we were saying earlier, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, follow our normal um, procedure, which is after um, I, uh, after Leah finishes introducing uh, Arndt, they're going to be the two, com the two presentations back to back, and then we're going to move to um, Q&A, all right? Leah. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm very happy that we can uh, welcome Arndt Nibisch from Vienna uh, to our group. Um, and despite uh, everything we dislike about Zoom, I am really glad for the opportunity to to bring out people from Vienna without having to travel. So thank you, Aunt, for joining <laughs> us uh, today. I'm very, very excited. Um, and the last time uh, I, I saw Aunt in person was uh, was in Vienna at the at the ICLA conference, I think in 2016. Mm. Um, so uh, uh, yes, 2016. Yeah. So uh, uh, his uh, his publications include um, the monograph "Media Parasites in the Early Avant Garde." Uh, which came out in uh, Palgrave in, in 2013, and um, uh, and more recently, uh, Kleist's Medien, so uh, a book on on Kleist's media, which um, uh, which I'm very very excited about, especially the book on uh, cybernetics, uh, uh, which uh, I I found super super good. Um, in the Kreuter. Uh, he has also written about Marinetti, um, uh, especially Marinetti's media aesthetics, uh, about Kafka and the technological sublime, about military intelligence, um, about uh, data science, uh, with Hausmann. So uh, uh, you can see his, his, uh, uh, the, the depth of his media study and literature interest is, is really, really broad uh, and exciting. Um, uh, he has uh, written his Habitilationsschrift in 2016 uh, and has told me that since uh, 2017 he's primarily working as a software um, developer so I think that that uh, could give us also some some good talking points in the end um, and um, apart from that uh, he has also taught in, in at several universities in North Carolina I think St. Mary's uh, Johns Hopkins um, uh, uh, and I'm glad that your uh, and your your global traveling has now included the virtual stop at, uh, at, at Stanford. So uh, please join me everyone in, in welcoming both Gisela Hefes and, and, and uh, Nibish. Gisela, the floor is yours. All right, uh, I am going to share my screen. Um, Right. Um, everyone can see it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I first I want to say that I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, I want to say thank you so much to Hector, to Jimena, to Romy, and to Leah for the kind invitation. Uh, I hope that next time we can do it in person. But in the meantime, I am very, very honored to be here. And I want to say thank you so much. Also, Aunt who is going to be talking uh, with me. Uh, thank you for those uh, brief conversations that we had before this meeting uh, that were very helpful. Um, what I would like to do today uh, is to go over some of the main aspects of my current research. Uh, even though I suggested to read a book chapter on toxic nature, uh, contaminated bodies and eco mutations in contemporary Argentine narratives, I invite you to think on this, of this presentation as a work in progress since the text I recommended is only a starting point. Uh, my goal is to cover some questions referred to in the chapter uh, and add some other inquiries I've been thinking about and developing lately. Some of these questions are laid out in the description that Arndt and I framed for this talk. Uh, what happens when toxicity breaks through its spatial containment? How can microorganisms contaminate spheres, bodies, media, narratives, and poetry, places, territories, and landscapes? 
how do parasites, viruses, or toxins penetrate, subvert, destabilize, promote, and or establish power structures and economic paradigms? And how do the politics of parasites and toxins irritate and shape contemporary art and media? Taking these questions into consideration, I will address and contain toxicity in contemporary narratives of Argentina as a discourse of mutation and inoculation that appeals to a toxic semiotic while rendering bodies and spaces phantasmagoric specters. While I focus on a handful of contemporary Argentine text textual narratives, it is my intention uh, in this book project to incorporate recent material from Chile, Brazil, and Uruguay. Uh, number one, I begin with what I call the rural turn, taken by recent Argentine narrative. These narratives have been produced where the countryside is the primary feature setting. The rural turn establishes a stark contrast with most writings during the 20th century, which prioritize the urban landscape. Two, the rural turn reconfigures and re semanticizes an emblem emblematic space such as the Pampa, a space infused with symbolic importance, including debates about national identity nation state formation and political, economic and cultural progress. Three, some examples of these new emergence are the novels La Inauguración of 2011 by Mariana Esprimer, El Viento Terraza of 2012 by Selva Almada, La Omisión of 2012 and Desmonte of 2015 by Gabriela Mazú, Matate Amor of 2012 and La Débil Mental uh, of 2015 by Ariana Harwitz, La Vi Mutar by Natalia Rodriguez of 2013, Estancia de Rescate of 2014 by Samantha Schweblin, Un Pequeño Mundo Enfermo 2014 by Julian Joven, Pseudónimo Cristian Molina, Las Amacas de Firmat of 2014 by Ivana Romero, El Rey de la, del Agua of 2016 by Claudia Aboaf, and Las Estrellas Federales of 2016 by Juan Diego in Cardona, among many others. Four, to reflect on the rural turn, I draw from Argentina critic Josefina Lutmer's work on the notion of the urban island. According to Lutmer, contemporary literature is now urban. It absorbs rurality and becomes barbarous. Although Luther considered a wide number of narratives in which the privileged diegetic site is the Latin American city, I read the juxtaposition that blurs and redefines the traditional boundaries that confronted urban and countryside spaces as a twofold mechanism where the rural also assimilates urbanity, rendering a disciplined and tamed territory. Five. Not only does the rural turn contest the classic dichotomy between urban and rural spaces, a bland opposition that from the onset of the 19th century conceived the urban space as the key locus for rebuffing and cleansing the barbarity deeply rooted in rural territories. And of course, uh, I'm thinking here of a parad paradigmatic text like Domingo uh, Faustino Sarmiento's uh, of 1845, but it also entails an important paradox. I will go over this towards the end. Six, if the city becomes barbaric and erases the spatial frontiers, likewise, the rural landscape is no longer untamed. Rather, it has become domesticated by the unfettered use of monocultures be they soil or wheat, and by the use of Pampian soil as an artificial lab laboratory where the global economy and an increasingly unregulated state intervene, thereby objectifying it. This mutation, which marks the emergence of a new rurality, 
one in which the countryside is anthropogenically intervened, trimmed, exploited, and reduced by the continued use of pesticides like diacinon and malassian and herbicides like glyphosate, questions, assumptions that assign both the urban and rural landscape define and exclusive traits. Not only is it the case that contemporary Argentine literature is no longer urban, but it's also true that aesthetic expressions that define the rural depart from previous representations of the Pampian landscape, thus reconfiguring the natural world. This metamorphosis led me to a first set of questions. A, how is the countryside, specifically the Pampa, represented in contemporary Argentine literature? B, what specific traits emerge alongside the implementation of neoliberal policies in a space that has long served as a symbolic reservoir of individual aspirations and national projects? C, what happens to the body flowing through the space of erasure, of contact, and contiguity? D, what is their physiognomy? E, what are they made of? Seven, I've been so far working with three novels, Distancia de Rescate, Las Estrellas Federales, and La Vimutat, as well as the poetry collection Un Pequeño Mundo Enfermo. I focus first on the aesthetic constructions of bodies and the strategically composed depictions that define the relationship between the subject and the natural world. I contend that spatial configuration, that the spatial configuration articulated in this new reality consists of a refutation of the unmistakable contrast between rural and urban, which is no longer operative and that accordingly, the Argentine rural space has become a locus that not only seeks economic growth, but also does so to the detriment of all living life forms, human and non-human organisms that coexist within entangled and contaminated ecologies. Eight, our time today does not allow me to expand and describe each of these texts in detail. So I will briefly comment on how uncontained toxicity pervades its spatial containment, both dis disseminating and disrupting socio-spatial structures and cultural paradigms. Distancia de Rescate, a novel many of you have read, tells the story of Amanda and her daughter Nina, who come from the city to spend their summer in the countryside and that of Carla and her son, David, who live in the rural region. David has been poisoned before the beginning of the narrative and his story sets off the conflict. David was intoxicated by coming, by coming into contact with water from a stream into which herbicides and pesticides had been dumped, albeit this is never described directly in the novel. Such poisonings occur frequently and they also take control of the bodies of Amanda and Nina. A conversation with David of the, on, on the novel's first page, which sets the story in motion, describes the effect of the poison as gusanos, worms in English, that is, an invisible substance all the town's residents experience, describing it as worms everywhere. In Juan Diego in Cardona's novella, Las Estrellas Federales, the mutants, the name is attributed to them from the, from the start, are part of a circus, a circus cast that inhabits the province of Buenos Aires. The story which begins in 1989 takes place in the past, but, it's also but it also represents a dystopian future. It is a post-apocalyptic world of discarded poems where mutations result from the critical state of the built environment, mainly due to abandoned and closed down factories, as well as the consequent loss of work for entire communities. The novel alludes to a phenomenon which, like the worms in Schrebens, 
occurs unexpectedly. Natalia Rodriguez's novel, La Vie Mutar, on the other hand, revolves around Vito, a young boy whose mother mutates into a monstrosity. Into a monstrosity that places her in the hospital, mysteriously disfigured and all covered with flowers. Witnessing the metamorphosis that culminates with her death, Vito notices that the same phenomenon occurs with a group of women whose husbands work in the same factory as his father. The story takes place in an unknown town in the neighborhood of Los Alamos, the, po uh, the poplars in English, although sarcastic references to the irony of the name abound in the novel, since what was supposed to be a grove has become a poor village without trees. And here I have a quote. Um, I'm gonna continue, but you can read it. Uh, although the cause of the mutation in the town is unknown, some clues suggest chemical exposure. Ito's best friend, Elige, has his house raided by the police several times because his father allegedly has a clandestine laboratory. Furthermore, a number of scenes imply that the illness produced by the exposure to the chemicals is contagious. Vito's mother rests in a confined room and entering the room where she's being monitored requires wearing an astronaut-like outfit. Finally, Julian Joven's poetry collection, Un Pequeño Mundo Enfermo, also refers to another phenomenon, this time simply called El Mal or Evil in English. The poems engage in opportune dialogue with previously analyzed novels. From its onset, the poetic voice intertwines the rural space, the body, and toxicity. The small sick world alluded to in the title is a world where cancer, asthma, and other illness related to the use of agrochemicals in the monocrop production of the Argentine countryside infuse the bodies of its main protagonist. Nine. The emergence of a toxic discourse, and here I'm borrowing Lawrence Buell's term, who adopts it in terms from Rachel Carson's novel, Silver Spring, defines a cultural production where an unknown occurrence, whether it be worms, a mysterious phenomenon, a mutation, flux, or simply put the evil, and licious. I argue that in the production of a new reality, microorganisms, both organic and inorganic, filters through body ma bodily matter, both human and non-human, altering their physiognomy and the vernacular, vernacular landscape, denaturalizing them. By appealing to a toxic semiotic, these aesthetics evoke a discourse of mutation and inoculation that decenters and interrupts the dichotomic imaginaries of the rural space. Moreover, they introduce a wide variety of organisms that by articulating an assemblage of body and soil, of space and time, reveal a spatial effacement that reshapes, decompose and recompose the natural and built environment. The politics of toxins can reconfigure former, former spatial rift, which now come converge into new modes of organization the city and the countryside, civilization and barbarism, the body and the landscape. 10. To conclude, similar to neo-extractivism, a practice that both progressive and neoliberal governments have been exploiting all over Latin America, the soy boom, along with other forms of crop growing in Argentina's rural areas, will have an enduring effect on the nature of the landscape and the landscape of nature, as well as on the organic bodies that inhabit it. The guiding principle that characterizes the ecosystem, meaning the chain of relations that interconnects different elements that was notably described by naturalists like Alexander von Humboldt during his travels in the 18th century reveals in these narratives both novels and poetry, that the 19th century disjunction that civilization once faced with barbarity reemerges now in a new form, no longer confronted in binary terms, 
but instead juxtaposed. If the ecological crisis is a transspatial, transnational, and transcontinental, continental, then contemporary Argentine writings appeal to a politics of toxicity that calls into question traditional stigmatizations, offering instead new corporeal ones, be they the stigma of illness, of deformity, or of monstrosity. After all, they signal a displacement within the aesthetic representations of the ecological crisis, one that has adopted an eschatological tone anchored in a discourse about the end of species, the end of forests, the end of glaciers, the end of the mountains and the aid of the oceans as we know them. Stemming from the intensification of technological change to use Giddens' expression, the natural world that has been replaced by a post-natural one, to use environmentalist Bill McKibben's term. A devastated, now post-natural, world that was documented by photographers such as Edward Wurtinsky and Chris Jordan. While Wurtinsky has portrayed the impact of oil production along with other ways of extractivism, Jordan documented the ongoing production of waste. Their works turn the gaze towards the residual ecologies of polluted landscapes that have disrupted human and non-human lives. Other images, such as those captured by Argentine photographer Pablo Ernesto Piovano, showcase the slow destructive effect of the agrochemicals, rendering visible what remains by and large invisible. While these toxins resist being captured by the eye, their continuous deployment through impalpable or presumably immaterial operate as post-human agents that pierce the materiality of the body, all bodies, all bodies alike, to res resurface as a physical distortion. Lucas Teixeira was born with ichthyosis, a disorder that causes dryness of the skin. His mother was in contact with glycopet during her pregnancy. Despite the fact that the images are not intended to be morbid, they are nonetheless disturbing, fluctuating between horror and surrealism. Toxicity, one may argue, entails a materiality and a materially eschatological framed reality. These visual accounts are relevant samples of microorganisms' influx into the human and non human body. They render discernible bodies that have been exposed both metaphorically and literally to a large material world that, as Stacey Alamo states, is penetrated by all sorts of substances and material agency that may or may not be captured. Gisella, Ironically, sorry to in interrupt, but since you asked me, uh, time is, is a little, you're going a little over time, just, just FYI. <laughs> I have just, uh, just one half page. Okay, wonderful. Perfect. Thank <laughs> Sorry you. for the interruption. It's okay. But now, hold on. Uh, where I was? Oops. And now I am. I can find. Okay. Okay, here. Ironically, why invisible, these substances emerge in the body as protuberance turning uncontained toxicity into material, concrete, and physical reality. So this is the last point, 11, to conclude. Rather than answers, I will move forward with another set of questions. Uh, A, how do we define, therefore, this aesthetic production? Um, B, in which genealogy should we inscribe it? C, how do we define its language? D, how is it reshaped by the politics of toxins? As a mere intellectual exercise, I would like to propose first that these aesthetic expressions make possible a toxic language that foregrounds a material phenomenon that, albeit indiscernible and by way of a slow violence, breaks through its spatial containment, an uncontained flow of toxicity that disrupts the space and the bodies that inhabit it. 
rendering them phantasmagorical specters and remnants of life. Second, the semantics of toxicity compose a language that interlaces through contaminated layers a tangible form of writing, a dermal textuality that decenters and destabilizes multiple dichotomies, cultural nature, city countryside, subject objects, and human on human. The rural trend therefore invites us to refle reflect on a reconfigured space where a different violence resides, an invisible and slow one that disputes national metaphors propose, proposing alternative imaginaries. At the time, at the time when an, eschatol an eschatological discourse has become a recurrent aesthetic and mediatic account, the conflation of the body with a toxic territory perpetuates the idea that humans and non-humans alike have become an economic resource, a disquieting metaphor of the new rurality, an extractive territory encroached and reduced but incapable of containing its own toxicity. And this is the paradox I referred to earlier. And thank you so much, and I apologize for going over the time. Art, uh, the, the floor is yours. We'll, we'll, we'll I can unmute myself, wait a moment and Sure. <laughs> uh, you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, I can share. How do I share? Okay, wait a moment. Just a second. No, that's wrong. So, yeah. Um, Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I took it as an opportunity, or I hope I will be able to take it as an opportunity. Nah, that's the wrong screen. I have two screens. Next. Can you see my presentation now? Uh, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Um, okay, now I have you guys here on the side. Push them there. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for um, the opportunity to let me uh, speak a little bit more on my research. Uh, Leah already introduced very nicely my three books. Um, uh, besides that, uh, so the newest book is the book on Kleist's Medien, my Habilitationsschrift, in which I try to argue that um, Kleist already had some kind of understanding of social media. So I really focused on Heinrich von Kleist, author around 1800, um, on Kleist as a publisher and journalist. And beside that, I worked a little bit on, uh, I have a constant interest, for example, in uh, Drew Verne. I think he's a very underrated theorist of modernity. And uh, <clears throat> I'm also um, tipping my feet, my toes a little bit in the question of the age and artificial intelligence. But uh, I thought for today, um, how do I, <laughs> wait a moment. Okay, um, uh, but today I uh, thought that <clears throat> I speak a little bit about my research on the avant-garde or my thinking about the avant-garde and um, since Media Parasite is now almost, yeah, it's now eight years old uh, or more than eight years old, I thought it's a good way, a good option to revisit my arguments. And to give that a little bit um, structure, I thought a text um, that's helpful to depart from would be uh, William S. Burroughs, The Electronic Revolution. Um, this is a text I'm discussing also in the piece I gave here for preparation. Um, and uh, The Electronic Revolution is a text that keeps on popping up in my mind. Uh, I, I keep on thinking about starting a new book project that actually departs from this 
text, uh, but every time when I look back into that text, I realize that it is a very, very dark um, rabbit hole. Um, very interesting, but very dark because Burroughs um, comes up with uh, ideas that he apparently takes from KGB brainwashing, uh, from Scientology, and from weird artists, uh, scientists nobody had, had heard before. And uh, when you start to do some research on all these topics, you realize that you perhaps don't want to know too much about all these things because they're really weird. So, but um, to give uh, a little um, summary of the text and uh, build an argument, um, I will give yeah, I will give a summary uh, that reduces some of those aspects and focuses on uh, other aspects that I think are worthwhile to discuss. Burroughs in this text introduces or stages the idea of the word virus. Um, here, and this is of course in the time of Corona, an interesting question, he um, comes up with an understanding of a virus. A virus is for him something that uh, lives in a correlation with a host. And the perfect virus is for uh, Burroughs a host that is um, dormant, so in complete symbiosis with its host. Um, but the virus initially is a dangerous threat, and uh, when a virus is dormant in another organism, uh, Boros recognize it as a constant threat that could break out any time. Um, this is similar to Michel Serre's understanding of the parasite, but also different, just briefly. Uh, Serre has this idea of the parasite um, that uh, lives together with a host, has a relationship to a host. Um, and um, the parasite is also, it's not dormant, but it's uh, in a constant state of irritation. So it keeps irritating the host. And um, the quintessence from this figure is that uh, the parasite is actually productive or forces the host in a certain mode of productivity because um, the host needs to nurture or react to the irritation of the parasite. And in my media parasite, I try to argue that the avant-garde artists are those parasites who um, keep interrupting the bourgeois order and therefore enforcing on the let's say bourgeois or the, uh, the creation of uh, more advanced, different ways of thinking and interacting. So, um, but in Burroughs, the virus is also some kind of parasite, but it's more a question of either dormant or it breaks out and became, becomes dangerous or deadly again. So how can this word virus, and, and by the way, the, the, the word, the, it's a word virus because language um, developed as an outcome of a viral infection of apes, uh, apes that survived these viral, infe viral infection um, had changes in their vocal cord according to Burroughs um, and uh, these apes are now human beings that have speech and uh, the word virus is still dormant in us. And uh, Burroughs now imagines that this uh, word virus could be uh, reenacted, reactivated. And of course, how can that be done through Burroughs' own cut up technology? Cut up in Burroughs is a very basic operation of montage where he cuts up text and reorders them in a different way. And uh, the text electronic revolution is basically a meditation of how this technique can be used with audio, audio tape recorders, how we can create scrambled um, montages as, as audio tapes. Um, this is important for um, Burroughs, actually, just a side note uh, from a Kitlerian mind, uh, Burroughs himself recognizes that this um, scrambling techniques uh, of audio tapes 
from uh, cryptology, uh, cryptography actually predates his own uh, cut up method that he took from Tristan Zara, another Dada artist. And um, this cut up, this scrambling of um, audio tapes is for um, Burroughs so important because he has this idea of um, uh, this idea that those tapes are extremely suggestive. Uh, he has this kind of brainwashing idea that because when you listen to a, to a tape that has these scrambled, mess scrambled messages, you will not understand the meaning of these messages, but they enter your mind and uh, let's say in your unconscious, they, 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 they stay there and eventually you will understand them. And uh, Burroughs says, this is great because then you think it's your own idea. So it's kind of a more or less sophisticated idea of media manipul manipulation. And Burroughs uh, further uh, comes up with, the, um, with this idea that now the, the, the action, the activity of the avant-garde, or he called them the underground press, um, is to take those recordings and play them in public places on location to reactivate the word, word virus and therefore unleash, uncontain um, the virus and uh, trigger something like a revolutionary uh, activity. Um, here I have just some quotes. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this too much. I just have them as a reference for, for the discussion. Um, here, this is just the, uh, the scene where the monkeys, uh, where he has come up with his uh, idea about the virus and the apes. Uh, then he speaks about here about um, this uh, voice scramblers that predate his cut up method. Um, then he speaks here about the underground press that has um, political potential because of those cut up tapes. And then uh, at the end here, there's uh, a quotation where he says, people should go out on and play those tapes on location. And I think that that's a, that's a very minor point, but it made me think, what does it mean for today? What's the status of uh, Borrow's cut up method today? Um, because obviously uh, in the 70s, if you were walking into a public square, with a tape recorder under your coat. Uh, this was a very geeky and strange uh, action to do. But today with our cell phones, everybody potentially could do that. And the basic question that perhaps I would like to discuss is if Borrow's ideas or more or less a lot of uh, questions, ideas from avant-garde aesthetics and arts, are there still, um, the privilege of the avant-garde is montage, is irritation, is disturbance. Is this still something that's uh, part of an yeah uh, aesthetic, progressive aesthetic paradigm, or is it more or less our normal media reality, or even worse, perhaps it's actually it turned into the device that was used or is used by right-wing media outlets. And uh, Burroughs already gives, gives us some kind of answer on that because the entire text, Electronic uh, Revolution, is um, based on the Watergate scandal. The reason why Boros writes about this text is the use of tape recorders through Nixon and the Nixon administration, which is a very complicated manifold thing and is not only um, uh, just um, wiring uh, the Watergate uh, offices. Um, two examples, what I mean by that, that today avant-garde techniques of irritation became our media normality. Um, are those two attention parasites and fake news, what are attention parasites? What I mean by that is, it's perhaps very simple, but I think it's very obvious that social media streams um, 
constantly uh, produce something that uh, in the Sears understanding could is a parasite. They constantly ask us to do things. And even if in our uh, YouTube streams uh, or Instagram streams, we only, we are in a kind of an echo chamber that reaffirms our positions, um, there is nonetheless uh, an extremely heterogeneous uh, a stream of material that constantly asks us and can be actually, I think, very much be described as a cut of reality. And then, after four years of Trump, uh, I think it became clear that fake news, I mean, fake news is a cut up. Fake news, to sum it up very briefly, um, is um, a mixture of reality and lies in a way where you cannot really tell the reality from the, the lie anymore. And um, yeah, I think this, this goes pretty much hand in hand with what uh, Boris described as media, subver subversive media uh, montage in uh, uh, the electronic revolution. And yes, um, and the scene that is so, such a great scene from a borrower's perspective, which actually illustrates um, the outbreak of borrowers in a very real way, um, is I think what we saw at the end of the Trump uh, administration in the Capitol. Um, this, this outbreak is, um, this is most certainly um, a true cut up of reality. So that's it. I stopped sharing. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, now I hear you again. Okay. <laughs> I was a little worried that I didn't hear anything. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, very much. There's a, a roaring uh, applause in the in the virtual space uh, coming your way. Um, and um, I, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Romina, Jimena, or Lea if they have questions now um, before we open it up to a general q and I, I have, as usual, some questions, but Happy to. So, uh, you may, why don't you start? And while we're doing, uh, while we're here, actors' questions or any other, um, also art to Gisela and, you know, and um, Gisela to art. Uh, if people want, they can raise their hand or otherwise they can use the QA um, feature so that we can read the questions if you don't want to make them yourself. And, and Romy, thank you for moderating uh, this 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 part. Um, wonderful. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to to uh, break the ice and uh, to celebrate these amazing contributions, um, work in progress, um, um, in, insightful uh, arguments that, that we've heard. And I want to formulate uh, some questions uh, for for each of the presentations, and and also one question that kind of like goes for for both. Now, don't feel obliged, please, to answer all the questions. I, I think it's good to uh, ask them, even if there isn't time to tackle all of them um, in the interest of our continuing uh, intellectual exchange. So for uh, Gisela, um, I'll uh, you know, make, make, make a question first about um, the role that desire um, might play in this cartography that you're building. And the reason why I bring it up is because pretty much all of the novels that you've mentioned, I haven't read them all, but several, uh, also have Desire as a rather prominent feature. And I wonder if that's just a coincidence, but I was reminded of uh, Harwick's Matate Amor, where you have the figure of the motorcycle that is very noisy and that disrupts the, the peace and the sensuality of the uh, greenscape that the protagonist is in. And also, of course, this being a motorcycle, it binds the world of the village with the rural idyllic French landscape in, in the novel. So that, that got me thinking about, you know, the problem of desire. Um, a second question would be the problem of class, especially as, 
you know, the, the, the rural urban divide or, um, you know, the, 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 the village and its outskirts is built into Raymond Williams's theorization of, of the novel. Um, and, and it's, you know, a trope that we're all familiar with. But of course, you're saying that this opposition is being erased. So, you know, should we throw away um, Williams's um, class-based analysis or reinvent it somehow? Uh, the third and final question would be about the relationship between toxic discourse and dissemination, which is the, the Derridian figure, right? La dissemination that um, is similar, right, in ways to what you're describing, but of course it, it's not identical. I, I, I was just, you know, wondering if, if there might be an interesting connection there. Uh, for, for Art, I, I have a, um, a question, um, and just, just the one, but I think it's, it's uh, significant, if, if I may say so, and then I'll ask the joint question. So the, the question for Art has to do with the fascinating uh, notion of the attention parasites um, your, your, um, you know, an enlivening of, of the borough's um, otherwise, you know, idiosyncratic style of thinking. I, I think you just, you know, did borrow such a huge favor. Um, but my question has to do with, with the figure of the, of the parasites and parasitism. Could it also be, I wonder, a case of mutualism or commensalism? Because not, not all relation between, um, organisms is parasitical, okay? Parasitical is, is you know, the, the, the guest is drawing from the host, but then you have the mutual where it's mutually beneficial and you have the commensal, which is, you know, just kind of like there in the way that, that, that some uh, viruses are just, you know, circulating through our bodies, but they're just there, not damaging us, not, right? So I, I was wondering if maybe that would be an, an interesting uh, venue to, to explore. And finally, the question for you, both to get that conversation started has to do with language. You were both at various times um, going from the metaphorical to the literal. You made explicit points about the continuities between the literal and the metaphoric. And when we talk about toxicity in this context, well, it's already metaphorical because, I mean, thankfully, um, we're not exposed to anything toxic at the moment in, in all of the rooms where we're at, uh, much as there is a virus going on and, and, and you could think of toxicity as something that's underlying, but, but you see what I mean? There's, there's something irreducibly metaphoric about our talking about toxicity, but you both made this point about the metaphorical and the literal going back and forth. Uh, in arts, avant-garde artists are parasites, right? So that, that is a big like metaphorical claim, but you're saying it's also literal in a way. And uh, in, in Gisela, um, you have, uh, you know, the, the dermal textuality, the post-natural world, and this idea of toxicity as something that affects the life of literary form and the very skin of children, um, right? So how do we go from the literal to the to the uh, metaphorical, are there pitfalls? Is that sometimes a categorical mistake? Just, you know, throwing it out there. And, and, and if, if, if you'd like, you could take it, you know, answer now or we can collect other questions. Either, either way is fine. Uh, thank you, Hector. And thank you, uh, Jimena. Um, should we maybe answer one at a time so we don't take over all the time again? I am now nervous. <laughs> after. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go to the first one and then I let Anne re respond and then we continue so we can try to put all together. Um, the first question that you made was regarding uh, the role of desire. Um, and you talk about Matate Amor. Um, I, um, I, I see the role of desire in different representations of the role space uh, in, in the context of Argentine literature, uh, but not precisely in this particular corpus. Uh, and what I'm trying to say is that um, desire has emerged more as a uh, sort of nostalgia towards uh, towards the past, an invented past, obviously. Uh, I created a mythology of uh, a national identity. 
uh, for instance, in the 1930s, uh, especially uh, with the emergence of the uh, uh, huge flows of immigrants into the city, uh, the patricians uh, in Argentina turn into the rural landscape as this romanticized, uh, nostalgic uh, space. Uh, but in the context of Matati Amor and these novels, uh, I, would, I, I would say that what is at play is not as much the desire, but uh, something that I will call like, uh, uh, like uh, and I'm kind of uh, here uh, thinking with you guys, but uh, a sort of like a culture of orphanhood, because Matatia Moore is about motherhood, actually, and it's about uh, how she rejects being a mother. And what you see in Distanza de Rescate is that the whole novel spins around her trying to save her daughter. And in this most pristine place, the most natural place, she gets contaminated in a peaceful uh, grove where they sit just to wait uh, for Carla. Uh, she, uh, she, she, she's exposed to the, uh, to the pesticides. So um, I, I, I would uh, move from this idea of desire towards a more, uh, more, uh, more towards this idea of there is, uh, uh, this novels present sort of a culture of orphanhood in the sense that I would think in terms of what uh, now some scholars call these cultures of care, uh, culturas del cuidado, that is missing. And that some, also some uh, eco-feminists have been uh, uh, placed in contact with uh, uh, this idea of neglected, uh, neglection of the, of the planet. So uh, in the context of this eschatological frame uh, reality, I, I find that uh, what is at stake more than uh, the desire is this uh, neglective aspect of of uh, parenting, uh, where the characters mostly are, uh, whose parents are dead, usually dead, or they are, uh, they go missing, or they are paralyzed, or they are um, uh, disabled. And, 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 in, and even when they, there is this kind of attempt of caring, uh, it fails. So I would, I, I would more, I would think more of these uh, novels and this text uh, in the frame of, uh, of, um, uh, negligence and uh, lack of, of performing or caring about a, a, a type of uh, culture of, of, of care that uh, kind of resonates with what's going on now with the, with the global crisis. Thank you. Okay, yeah, you, you asked me um, very tough questions. Um, you, you, you sound a little bit like my dissertation advisor. <laughs> <laughs> Especially this question, which means the literal, the metaphorical, always came up. I never was able to uh, solve it. But um, let's start with the first thing with the mutualism and the conventionalism. Um, I think they they kind of I mean I, I see them as linked basically. Um, the two questions, not the mutualism and the conventionalism. Um, the, 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 you're right. With, when you speak from Sea with a parasite, the, the, there is some some economy going on between them. And when we when we talk about nature, um, this is a kind of a very um, yeah, not necessarily anthropocentric, but subject or agency centered way of thinking. And um, and it's, it's an interesting question. How do you think that in a different way? Um, how do you think about uh, a situation that's not based on a set of agents that interact with each other? Um, this is something that keeps me on in my re research on data. This is something that I never really understood when we look at data, when we look at uh, German data, we're looking on this really small group of people that did nonsense. That, I mean, most literally, and you could even argue that this was not really particularly good art, but they became famous. They, they became canonical in art history 
Why? I don't know. There are probably thousands of other figures at the same time who did very similar thing, but we don't know about it. And that is, you know, that's basically the second camp you're talk, talking about. And of course, you know, and this is something I think really critical we have to be in the humanities. Uh, I think this is something called like survivor bias, right? Um, uh, that we uh, heuristically only look at the people that survive, so to speak, in the in the history, in the canon of our disciplines. And um, I mean, I don't know if the, the age digital humanities will fulfill this promise, but I think one of the promises of digital humanities is that you have this kind of neutral reader that just without making judgments collects all the data that is literature at a certain given point in time. But then the other question is, do we find this interesting? I mean, <laughs> as, as, as heuristic material. And yeah, and I think also the question of the little, little metaphorical is, is kind of re, uh, related to that. Um, for example, when you when you when 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 I constantly describe the para, the, the artists as the parasites, that's a metaphor metaphorical thing. But um, uh, and I know that this is kind of. Uh, from a postmodern perspective, not very, uh, very clean mythologically, but um, that makes it easier to tell the story. <laughs> and, you know, in the end, we, we still need to tell stories. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I don't know if I want to want to collapse it just for the sake to have a better argument. Um, Thank you. Uh, um, before taking more questions, I just wanted to point out that um, on the issue of class, right, that's that's lingered there at, at some point. Um, one of the most successful uh, art films uh, recently made, um, Parasite, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, articulate, right, the, the parasitical and the class uh, clash, right, that's that, that might be symptomatic. Uh, mm. in a way. Uh, other questions or comments? Seva um, uh -huh. in the in the attendee list has a question. So Seva, yes, I yes, yes. allow you to talk. Uh, if you're in mute, Sebastian. I think. I'm mute. Do you hear me now? Yeah. Take yep. Hello. Um uh, Congratulations uh, to uh, Gisela for for an excellent uh, uh, talk and congratulations, sorry for for the reader and uh, I really enjoyed your talk and, and and the chapter that you sent um, out and uh, I, I want to take the opportunity also to uh, give a shout out to Hector Jimena and Romina for organizing uh, Materia, um, a wonderful space um, and um, I have a sort of like a common question for for Gisela. Um, uh, I really like the idea of uncontained uh, toxicity and um, uh, the idea of uh, spaces of containment and it, uh, it made me think of the laboratory um, uh, as a place, an artificial place where you can experiment with nature, you know, um, and at the same time um, try to avoid any mistake, you know, try to control the results of the, your experiments. And when the laboratory uh, goes out or nature is, is the laboratory, and I think that that idea appears in your, in your chapter two, uh, nature as a laboratory, um, um, then you don't have uh, containment, right? Uh, you don't have um, the, the boundaries of the artificial space that is the, in the lab. And um, so, so uh, I really like that that idea because it's it's like moving to nature, you know, and experimenting with nature, and then you have these issues like uh, you know, like um, 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 like dissemination of or or even disasters, you know, like spills in the case of, um, of you know, like uh, natural disasters, but there are. Um, man-made, right? So, so uh, I guess that my question is about accountability uh, when it came when it comes to to these um, um, 
disasters or these um, um, uh, unexpected results, right, in the in nature as a laboratory. And I wonder if this this in, in your reading of this novel, you find something like 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 uh, um, like uh, uh, an indictment or like accountability um, 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 when when it comes to to these uh, uncontained toxicities. Thank you, Sebastian, for your question. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes, Anyone? yes. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm Thank still you so much. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, I, 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think you read very well the idea that I'm trying to formulate here that, uh, that you just said is, is it's exactly that. It's, uh, this uncontained toxicity uh, uh, is using uh, nature and actually, I mean, in a, a larger scale, uh, the whole world has become the laboratory, right? We are living in uh, uh, our, our existence with COVID, we are seeing it right now, is a living laboratory where is there's a spill over spill over spill. Uh, and it doesn't come from, uh, from the Chinese laboratory, it comes from nature, actually. So is uh, we're really kind of uh, living and talking about metaphoric uh, and, and, and little like the, the boundaries are also blurred in that particular case. Uh, so I think you read that very well. Uh, there is one case which is very interesting and I was thinking of that today actually in La Vie Mutard that the character has a, the father as I said does have a laboratory. So you have this kind of uh, uh, set of uh, uh, Chinese um, uh, boxes, right? One laboratory inside the other, like the big laboratory as a meta uh, reference of the one that is happening uh, in the novel itself. And in terms of uh, accountability, um, there, is, uh, there is none. Uh, and I think that also talks about, uh, um, it talks about the, 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 the kind of like this type of uh, risk uh, space or risk space as uh, Ursula Heiss calls them uh, that we are uh, living today where we are continuously exposed uh, to slow and fast violence and, uh, and really there is nobody uh, accountable. So uh, in the text themselves, uh, there is no, uh, is, 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 and this is what I, I think interests me the most because I didn't have time to talk about, you know, hyper objects, low violence, and many other theoretical concepts that come into uh, this idea that gives you a better sense of scale. But we're talking about uh, there's a problem of scale here where we are uh, uh, kind of immersed with, uh, inside this laboratory where uh, these phenomena take place. Uh, but they, take, they occur like COVID, it occurs, right? And, uh, uh, and we are sort of not ready for that. And uh, um, I don't know, I, I, I would like to think that, uh, that there is some sort of uh, correlation with what Arne said uh, about, you know, the, the, uh, uh, this kind of idea of the parasite as, as a revolutionary, uh, way of changing or irritating. Uh, but I, I think that it, this is not the avant-garde. This is not irritating. This is just kind of documenting, indexing uh, that sort of reality. So mm -hmm. um, I, I was trying to kind of throw a parallel with what he, uh, he said and maybe uh, how ch time changes and maybe the role of right now of, of uh, if there is an avant-garde, maybe there is not, I don't know, uh, you might know better, uh, maybe we can think about, you know, the role of art, right, uh, in, in, as a sort of disruption, uh, and to what extent is disruptive, it's disruptive, but how disruptive it is, right, so, uh, I don't know, I'm just throwing that to the discussion, uh, and I, I hope Sebastian, I answer your question. Yeah, most definitely. Thank you so much. I, uh, I said in the, in the chat that 
uh, a sense of scale is, is, is crucial to talk about accountability. And, and I think that you addressed that in, in, in the last part of the chapter. So, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, really interesting. Thank you. Okay, if, Jime, do you want to pose your question? We're running out of time. So if no one else among our attendees has a question, uh, Jime, go ahead. I think um, Leon was also have a question. So my mine was um, one, one, one ask, I, I'm sorry. Could you please so, um, he may ask your question, Lea? You ask your question as well, and then we allow our speakers to respond. Cool. Okay. Um, so this is. I'm gonna try to be brief. This is just like a comment to try to um, put together the two talks because I keep thinking that. Um, there is an economic aspect to um, both that, that interests me. So I was wondering if at all um, you would consider uh, before Verardi the idea that there is um, a connection between biogenetics and computing in that they're both recombinations that create value. Um, and I'm just gonna throw that out there and pass it to Leah. <laughs> um, uh, thank you both so much um, for for your talks. Um, uh, Gisela, just for to to connect to what you said last. I mean, I do think that uh, one of the questions I had for Aunt, but it, it's now uh, strikes me as a question for both of you, is to. Uh, I mean, I'm curious about the whole like the whole maybe history or, or, or relationship of disruption to art, which, which strikes me as something that is, of course, always part of art since, uh, you know, since we, you know, since we have art and know what, you know, have engaged uh, in art, even, you know, even something like cave paintings would be a, a disruption of a natural environment because you leave your print somewhere, but also in, and even with Aristotle, thinking about mimesis, it, it is like one of the goals was to reach a certain effect in the audience. And that is a kind of dis disruption. And then, and of course, in the 20th century, we have, you know, defamiliarization um, and Verfremdung's effect, which is exactly the same where you try to disrupt uh, some expectation in order to be able to move the audience or an Empfindsamkeit, right? It's the question like, how can you move the soul? Like, what do you need to do? What does a poem need to do in order to, to achieve that? And so, uh, like one way to describe what's happening with art is to say that, like, is to say that art is like, is not trying to to transmit a message as clearly as possible, but it's it's about some broader concept of communication that humans engage with, both engage with both artistically, um, and I think also in in daily life where we can talk to each other with with plenty of noise and um, and disruptions, and we can still um, understand each other. Um, uh, so even if you know I skip a word or uh, if uh, if I talk too fast or a little bit too slow, so uh, there's also in all sorts of ways I would say that disruption is a completely normal part of communication, um, uh, and and so of of arts. It strikes me as kind of interesting to think about what happens if if we don't see this if we don't treat disruption as an outlier um, uh, to art. Uh, and I think maybe uh, Aunt, then we can think about your data question in a little bit of a of a dif of a different way. And then the other brief thought I had um, was uh, that of course we cannot escape or resolve the the question of what, when would we use something literally and metaphorically because uh, you know we're humans with human language and we try to understand the world from our perspective and with the tools linguistic tools that we have. And so sometimes it's a grammatical restriction because we have to say the printer prints, even though printing, you know, comes from a human action. So it is kind of a metaphorical action that we apply to technology, thus making them, you know, perform the same actions that humans engage with. Uh, engage with. So I think some of it is this grammatically um, uh, uh, necessary, but of course it also shapes the way we think and approach and fear technology. Um, so I don't think it's it's about really figuring out when something is literal and metaphorical, but the, probably about the configuration of uh, the interaction between literal and metaphorical concepts and how we how we use them and with what intention. Would you say that that could be? Yeah, I mean, this is this is um, 
this is not directly related to to the talk, but to, to your question. Um, I'm now working for few, four years primarily as a software engineer, and one of the most amazing things when I came there to start programming was to realize the the unit in which computer programs are developed are stories. The features that you um, uh, implement their stories. So there's a, uh, we really think about this as stories and uh, a bigger set of stories are epics. So um, I, I found it very amazing to go into this much more technical field to realize that they are so metaphorical. They also speak constantly about experience and stuff. Like right, right. That. So I, I mean, just, just on that. Um, and um, yeah, also the question about art and this disruption, it's really, perhaps you have some tips and advice for me, but uh, when I look at, uh, I, I keep on looking at digital art and I find it very difficult to find something that behaves in a way that, you know, in other fields art behaves. It doesn't really seem, I mean, seem to be something like, um, uh, digital art that really makes it big, so to speak, that there are, I mean, it, it seems to be that there are a lot of digital experiments, but they're, they're, they don't get traction. I mean, Hector, perhaps that's, that's the art that, <laughs> that just ex exists next to us or something, perhaps it's, it's that, but it's, it's you, uh, when you look at digital poetry or something like that, yeah, it exists, but it, it's not, not getting really a big traction. Um, and um, I don't know why. This is interesting for me, but I, I, it's an observation and I don't know why. And, and, and then of course, a little question about the interaction of biogenetics and computing. Um, I think we see with, 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 with Corona uh, that uh, those things are intrinsically uh, um, connected just in the development of the, 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 the vaccines and things like that. Um, and what I think, I mean, I'm not really working on AI, but from my understanding is that the principles that are behind YouTube's and Facebook's AI systems are similar things uh, that are used then for developing uh, to, to, to uh, analyze the permutations of viruses and the mutation of viruses. I find that kind of interesting. And that's probably a really interesting question from a new materialism standpoint. Okay, we yeah, have- Yeah, but just, yeah, yeah. But just Gisela also gives some of it. Yeah, no, I just, yes, sorry. For your intervention, we have a question for you in the Q&A. So I'm going to read the question and maybe since Anne talked about stories and narratives and Leah was also talking about normalcy and the question ties both together. So maybe I can ask the question and feel free to sort of <laughs> answer as you, as you see fit the, the previous question and then this question. Okay, um, so uh, the question is from Melissa, a very, very active member of the group sending hugs to Melissa. Uh, thank you to both presenters for your wonderful presentations. I have a question for Professor Hefes. In the novels you analyze that deal with toxicity and encountering post-nature life worlds, how do the narratives ultimately resolve? Do they resist their new mm -hmm. toxic realities or accept them as the new normal? I ask this question because I work with narratives that also feature toxicity, parasites, and mutants, but they often ultimately describe a yearning to return to a previous state of normality and health. For example, the protagonists mm -hmm. fight the invading parasites and mutant characters tend to get killed off or disappear by the end of the story. If the novels you study do something similar, how do you reconcile their descriptions or tox of toxicity with the narrative's yearning for non-toxic? Normal well, I don't know what to say or where to start because there's so many questions and so many things to, to say. Um, I want to answer that question, but I, I also would like to say, add something to what Anne said uh, just quickly because I think that can follow up uh, 
and I don't want to forget uh, because there is that question about dissemination that Hector made at the beginning that we did not answer, but uh, I, I was thinking throughout all the, the conversations that dissemination is also a way of dispersion. Uh, when you disseminate, you disperse. And uh, something that Arndt was saying that I find very interesting is this idea of, uh, um, uh, of cut up that he was talking about, but also this idea that he was uh, bringing it at the end of uh, fake news and Trump. And then I was thinking, what really strikes? What disperse? What disrupts? And I was thinking, what disrupts me? I can, I, I, I like you guys uh, read a lot of novels, watch a lot of movies, go to a lot of exhibitions, and yet I don't feel disturbed. You know, it doesn't irritate me. It doesn't go to that point of, uh, you know, like art changes, you know, my worldview. But then I see fake news and it does. So there is kind of like a transposition. I don't know, I'm just playing with this idea, uh, but there is a sort of transposition of the role for the media now, uh, where we can find that uh, it does irritate because I don't know, again, you, but during the four years of the Trump era, I was glued to my phone, reading the news nonstop. And as soon as he's off, you know, I stopped. So it was irritating me, it was disturbing me, it was, it was uh, disrupting, that's the word, disrupting my daily life. I would stop, I would working, and I would read the news to see what he did or what he said. So I don't know, here I'm, I'm trying to think about this idea of dispersion, you know, uh, and how dispersion maybe waters down to some extent uh, the effect uh, of uh, of, of art and the avant-garde, if there is an a current avant-garde, but then how in turn, there are other mechanisms, other dispositions, other uh, devices that trigger different type of disruptions that are not connected to art uh, in the proper sense, but they are art because they're collage. Fake news is a collage of lies. And that is sort of a, an art. Right, so I'm just thinking about this uh, uh, with you, uh, Art, with what you said, and I, I just wanted to kind of make a comment because mm. uh, it, it could help us to think uh, also not just uh, uh, the role of dissemination, but also the role of arts now, and, and, and how do we understand and what is disruptive and what is not disruptive and to what extent art is disruptive or not. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's lost that privileged uh, mm -hmm. uh, function. So that, uh, should I answer now to the, the, the other <laughs> question or maybe? I'm yeah, I, I mean, I, this is kind of what I tried to say. It was very nice <laughs> summarized. It seemed to <laughs> work that my cut up uh, popped up in your head. <laughs> <laughs> Artificial intelligence, we're connected. <laughs> Working. <laughs> no, and, and in terms of the question of the of the uh, uh, of Melissa. Uh, Melissa, I, there have been different outcomes depending on the novels. Uh, in Samantha Schwebel's novel that most of you might have read, there's sort of a denial uh, attitude on behalf of the, uh, of the main character, Amanda, who doesn't want to uh, really come to terms of uh, um, what's going on until she eventually dies. Uh, but uh, some other novels like Incardon is more like, uh, I would say more more uh, uh, Arians, uh, like Cesar Arias uh, style. So it's a little bit more uh, surrealist and more like uh, hyperbolic. So it ends with the, the whole Provincia de Buenos Aires, which is the province of Buenos Aires disappears. Uh, so, and, and it's amazing. I recommend it to read because it's, it's the, whole, the whole story is so absurd uh, and so uh, exaggerated and it, hyperbolic that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting to read. But uh, so it has a different, uh, a, a different uh, um, uh, uh, 
a different a way of, uh, of, of concluding. And then uh, the poems uh, are usually also very uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, existential in the sense that also there is, uh, there is not too much after those uh, uh, rains of green seeds that come from the glyphosate. And then uh, uh, La Vimutar is also another example of an Ida's type of novel where the characters also end up uh, living and just the, just the neighborhood in itself uh, is, uh, is almost like uh, uh, wiped out with a fire. So uh, there are different outcomes and I think there is more, uh, uh, depends on the, the case, you will find different uh, uh, ways of coming with terms of the, this post-natural world. It, it is a, a, a testament to, to the quality of, of our conversation that I don't know about you, but I'm super intrigued. I could go on for a long while, but I, I know that folks have other commitments and, and it's- And also it's, it's late at night for- it, it, our, our night has to go to sleep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so very much. Um, I'll, I'll close with a, with a bit of a, a metacritical comment. Um, it's interesting in, in this conversation that new materialism has been the medium, the glue, to connect media studies and environmental humanities. And that's interesting because the institutionalization after Kepler, right, of uh, media studies has made it quite contained. <laughs> and, and, and this has been an exercise in, in, in uncontaining, you know, what um, media studies was doing already um, in that new materialist vein. Um, and, and, and the consequences are, are, are uh, quite real. They, they extend to our, our uh, living environment. Um, again, just a quick uh, metacritical observation there. It's interesting to see how our uh, thought processes continue to evolve. Um, thank you so, so very much. Uh, whenever Romy is ready to hit the pause recording button, we'll do that and we can... Uh,